Hi, I'm Gordon Layup here, and welcome to the Real Finance Podcast, the podcast series where we interview key entrepreneurs, scientists, and activists who are shaping the commercial real estate industry, and as a result, our world. In today's podcast, we'll be speaking with Bernard Rees. Bernard is founder and chief education officer at Reshare LLC, which seeks to empower real estate investors with tax advice and financial tools to get more out of their assets. On the podcast, we discuss common real estate tax savings, cost segregation, the ins and outs of 1031 exchanges, and the future of the tax code. If you like saving money, it's well worth a listen. Bernard, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast today. Uh, one of the things we like to start out with is uh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's do it. Uh, Gordon, firstly, thanks so much for hosting me today. An honor and a pleasure to be here. As I mentioned, I can, you know, the the thoughtfulness with which you craft and create uh, these podcasts is so evident. Uh, so truly an honor to be here. Uh, regarding my background, I am a CPA uh, in terms of licensing, but more broadly, just a tax and financial nerd with regards to real estate and really so many other um, asset classes and tools. Uh, topics that we typically cover are 1031 exchanges, cost segregation, um, real estate retirement accounts. And of particular interest is really how all these things come together, how they integrate with each other, and how they impact every investor. Because no two investors are alike. And so these tools all have their places. But the reality is that with all the powerful tax tools that real estate has, um, everybody's got their own tax profile. So are you investing as an LP? Are you investing as a GP? Are you doing your own deals? Are you flipping? Are you buying and holding? Um, are you a real estate professional um, You know, from a tax perspective? So there are so many really great angles to explore and get you know, kind of scratched beyond the surface. Uh, and I'd love to explore that today. So let's start by exploring why you got into the tax game. Like there's a lot of stories and a lot of uh, interesting ways that people get into the professions, but why tax? So I, I'd be frank, it didn't, I can't say it was necessarily planned. Uh, you, know, you know, people wanted to think like, oh, I planned it. I planned a hundred steps ahead. Absolutely not. Uh, but it is uniquely suited to what I actually love doing, right? Each one of us has the kind of things that that we love doing. And thankfully, we all love doing different things. Um, and this way, we can all complement each other and add value to each other. If we all wanted to do the same thing. Uh, but I do say, like, loving tax code is probably, you know, it's not not that many people actually love that. Everybody loves saving money on taxes. Um, but actually enjoying tax code um, is something that I say is a little more unique. So, you know, I, I ended up there. Uh, one of the first projects that I worked on was a tax, was a tax related project. Uh, but it really brought in so many aspects of, it wasn't just tax, it was employee benefits law, tax law, regulations, case law. And it's kind of the rest is history, as they say. Uh, once you get into this thing, and, and you find something you have a passion for, and you run with it. Well, I'll, I'll say this. So I ran the tax law clinic in law school. Um, and so uh, there would be two or three members of our massive tax law class every year that would probably enjoy tax. And the professor would very quickly identify them and say, if you enjoy this, this is this is for you. Um, for the rest of us who, uh, you know, I... I I think tax is all right, but um, I'd, I wouldn't say I enjoy it. Um, I'd leave it to the professionals. So leaving it to the professionals uh, like yourself, Bernard, could you tell us a little bit about what you think one of the biggest uh, tax concerns you do when you look at an individual real estate investor? So uh, let's say this is just a generic investor. He comes, sits down with you and says, you know, where, where are the ways that I can save and, and get cost savings on a, a, a real estate investment going forward? So the beauty of real estate is, is that it really more so than many other areas, uh, many other industries, it has so many tax incentives and tax tools available. Uh, where it gets thorny 
is understanding how those impact a particular individual. And then beyond that, you know, while primarily, right, you know, the, the business that I'm in from business perspective is actually providing these services, uh, meaning trying to bridge the gap between tax expertise and tax tools. So we, we're a 1031 exchange service provider. We provide plus segregation services. We provide real estate retirement account services. But if you talk about working on a one-on-one -on -one basis, it's really trying to see, number one, how all these things actually flow through to individuals' tax return. Uh, so we'll be able to give people information that they may not get elsewhere when they say, oh, I want a plus segregation report. So there are, you know, it's not just about, all right, signing up and getting a document. Um, if we break it down, um, there's a lot of uh, many layers and, and not to, no, number one, no two cost segregation reports are alike. Number two, no two investors are alike. So what you really have to look at is, all right, how is this actually going to impact you as an individual? So the first thing is people got to understand is calculate your true ROI on using any particular real estate tax tool. Um, if we and we do, we can use this with almost any tax tool that's out there, uh, but we use cost segregation for a moment. So when we do cost segregation reports or feasibility analyses, we have to make assumptions um, to incorporate. So there are the heart of a cost segregation study is taking a lump sum purchase price and then allocating it, allocating that cost to particular components. That's the kind of the heart of what we do. But there are many, many, let's call, you know, kind of contextual factors in the deal and with regard to the investor profile that are really going to drive the ultimate impact. So what are some things uh, that are going to drive that? Uh, and we'll kind of, we'll start broadly and kind of work our way in. So the first thing is, you know, suppose you actually get all those deductions. Um, what's the real value of that tax deduction? Well, in the perfect world, you're going to be able to use that to really benefit and be able to get the perfect ultimate value from a cost segregation study. So suppose the cost segregation study is going to give you an additional $500,000 in tax deductions. Now, you take that $500,000 and you put it in your tax return. What's it actually going to do? Well, if you have passive income, $500,000 of passive income to offset, and your cost segregation deduction comes in as a passive loss, beautiful, right? You just knocked out 500 k of income. That's amazing. All right. Alternatively, um, you have 500 k of active income, and your cost segregation losses get qualified the same way because you're a real estate professional. For tax purposes, you materially participated, um, and again, they net out. All right, so now they net it out. Now, what's the real value of that? Well, that's going to va vary. Number one, what is your actual tax rate? Right? What's the value of that? What's your true tax rate? Do you have other losses? Do you have other? What's else going on in your tax return? So we know what your true tax rate is. Well, if you're in the top federal tax bracket, then you got right there. You got thirty-seven percent. Um, you know, that's what the actual dollar deduction is. Number two, which state are you in, right? If you're a state that has no state income tax, right, and so is your deal, right, then your ROI is lower. But if, say, you're in New Jersey or California or New York, right, so on top of 37% savings, we can add state-level savings because your state would tax you on that income as well. But Let's take a step further, right? The biggest driver of cost segregation tax benefits has been bonus depreciation. However, many states that do have an income tax do not conform to federal bonus depreciation rules. So some states are like, hey, we just follow whatever, you know, Congress says at the federal level, we just follow it. Other states have very conform or don't conform to varying degrees. So the cost segregation study may say, hey, there's $500,000 of deductions in here, but that's using bonus depreciation. But your state, your state taxing authority 
or local taxing authority, which applies to some folks, um, doesn't recognize that. So the actual impact of that deduction, you know, that you get, the mileage that you're going to get is going to vary based on how that actually impacts your personal tax profile. Any questions about that? So I don't have any questions about that, but I think the biggest question and the biggest misconception that typically um, happens in real estate, particularly on like real estate Twitter or on LinkedIn, where I see people discussing all various things of tax and have no idea what they're talking about. And this is coming from someone, you know, who took some courses in tax, but I'm not a CPA. And I'll, I'll be like, OK, these guys don't know what they're talking about um, is what types of properties and investors are actually eligible for cost segregation? Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. People will say, oh, you invest in real estate. Like you can um, be part of the, um, you know, the benefits of cost segregation. Who actually is um, one of the individuals that you can help with this process? Yeah, awesome question. So from, and it's very much like you said it, different asset classes are going to generate different levels of ROI. But technically, every asset class is eligible for cost segregation. The question is, though, who's actually going to benefit from having their deductions? <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. So if somebody has, you know, where it's most common, the most common misconceptions is when somebody is getting those losses flowing through to their tax return as a passive loss, and passive losses cannot offset active income. Uh, so this goes back to, you know, really 1986 tax reform, and it got some tweaks over the subsequent six years. Uh, Congress said, hey, we see people that are investing money in deals, not because they want to get the ROI on the deal. And so whereas with regards to, and again, the fact that Congress picks on it highlights where the benefit lies, right? There is a holy grail here. Right? Okay. That's why Congress okay. singled it out. Uh, so. With regards to any type of activity, you simply have to meet, you know, the material participation tests and it becomes active. And then you can use that if you're making money as a doctor and attorney and they can be netted. Right. So we just have to figure out where which business activities you materially participate in and which ones you do not. Can I dive, um, can I dive a little further into that? And um, yes. can you explain a little bit what material participation is? Yeah, let's do it. So there are seven tests, really, for material participation. Um, and what Congress is looking for is stuff that you're, you're actually involved in. And which test you'll have to meet will vary based on the circumstances. Uh, so there are most typically what we're going to see is that you, you're involved for 500 hours of the course of the year, um, 100 hours, right? And nobody else is involved more than you are. Or you're doing substantially all the activities with regard to that business. So not a hard hour. Um, so there are some additional tests, but those are typically what we're working with. So there's some, there are some tests based on significant participation hours. There are some that you can meet simply by having been a material participant in prior years. But typically we're looking at 100 hours, substantially all, or 500 hours. Um, now these hours are not hours that you're doing. Uh, you know, looking around, hunting for, you know, reviewing financial statements or listening to awesome podcasts like this one. Um, it's got to be, you know, actual hands on involvement in operations, not investor activities. Now, the to bring it back to what Congress did for real estate, Congress initially said that for real estate related stuff, real estate is per se passive, which means that there was no way to make real estate active. So <laughs> even if you met material participation requirements, it is still passive. So Congress singled out real estate for a kind of this treatment uh, where there was no way to use real estate losses to offset any active income. It became per se passive. Uh, but that did result in a, in a Pretty substantial, you know, inequity uh, because you had folks that were engaged in real estate 
um, as part of an integrated business, real estate developers um, that had components of their business that generated rental income or loss. And they were, they came back to Congress and said, hey, we're getting this inequitable treatment. Um, and for us, real estate rental is really part of a broader unified enterprise um, of which real estate is just one component. So we shouldn't get singled out that losses from that component can't offset income from another component of essentially the same pursuit. So Congress created the real estate professional tax status. Um, and so if somebody becomes, achieves real estate professional tax status, if you fall within that bucket, and here's something really important, then real estate activities can be treated very much the same as any other activity, which means if you materially participate in that real estate activity, you can use those losses. So it is a two-step process. Uh, number one, you first have to qualify as a real estate professional. However, even if you qualify for real, as a real estate professional, that does not mean that you can now claim your losses from any real estate activity. You have to then mit meet the material participation standard um, just as you would with any other business. So real estate professional status creates the opportunity to uh, treat real estate activities the same as you would any other business. It just kind of overcomes the presumption that real estate is passive, but you still have to actually make it active. So this is super complex um, tax stuff, and there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of planning and strategy opportunities. Uh, to bring it back to what we deal with daily is when we do, we don't want people, you know, when they come to us for retirement accounts for real estate, 1031 exchange or cost segregation, we don't want to say, oh, sure, sign on the dotted line and we'll get a cost seg study. We want people to understand, oh, come tax time, you know, are you actually going to benefit from, from this? You know, you're exactly. going to come to you. People are like, they come to their, they're so excited. They go to their CPA and the CPA is like, <laughs> mm, yeah, you got this great thing here, um, and where this is going to go get carried forward, you're not actually going to benefit from this. So we want awareness, um, and that's really where I came from as a CPA, seeing how so many people um, get various tax tools, um, but they don't really benefit from them. We want people to understand, um, is this going to benefit you or not? Because we want, ultimately, it's about providing value. It's not about, oh, sure, here's your cost sex study. Um, and then all of a sudden you get let down. Uh, but it, it, the reality is we can't actually know everybody's entire tax profile, but we want them to have the awareness and we want them to be able to you know, say, hey, okay, let me check with my CPA. Is this going to benefit from me? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Game on. If not, you know, this way, because you have to be able to make an informed um, decision about, you know, should I do a 1031 exchange? Should I do a cost segregation study? Should I be setting up some sort of retirement account uh, for real estate investing? So I, I know we could dive into the wood, woods deeper. Um, and um, look, I'm somebody who, who took some tax law courses, and I certainly could at least put my toe in the water. But I'm not sure that's what our listeners want to hear on the podcast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift over to one of the other topics you mentioned, 1031 exchange. So first of all, what is a 1031 exchange and how does that factor into the real estate game? Yeah, let's do it. So 1031 exchange um, is a way to defer taxes very much, very similar to cost segregation. And I think this is a good opportunity to talk about um, the be true benefits of tax deductions, how to quantify them. And it does relate a bit to what we we're just talking about in the cost segregation context. So say you got your tax deduction, your tax deferral. All right, so now we can quantify, we were based on your tax profile and the tax tool that we've used, we've quantified the number. All right, you're gonna be saving $100,000 on your tax return this year, right? You otherwise would have paid $200,000 in taxes, now you're only paying $100,000. 
the true power of a tax deduction is how you then deploy. You have $100,000 in your pocket. How do you actually use this $100,000? Now, you can go buy yourself a luxury watch, um, which, you know, if that's what you like to do, that's a great. And some of them are actually appreciate value and they grow up actually be part of your investment portfolio. Um, however, the true value is taking that $100,000 and then reinvesting that. And within the real estate context, this is really, really powerful. So you can buy $100,000 of stocks and you can get, you know, over your lifetime, say, you know, stock market returns, the compound annual growth rate of 10% per year. Okay, that's great. Uh, but with real estate, you can actually, for $100,000 of, of, of down equity, you could buy $400,000 of real estate. Right, So you are actually getting the huge multiplier effect. So it's really about taking these tax savings, putting them into the next deal, then benefiting from the compounding and appreciation on four times your tax savings. Right, And if you're a long-term real estate investor and you stay in this game, that is worth millions. I mean, it's, you know, you need the right inputs for each particular individual, but $100,000 saved on a deal, reinvested, right? And you do on the next deal, cost segregation, 1031 exchange, whatever it is that you're doing, right? Over a decade, that's easily worth millions of dollars. So I like to say tax tools are not really tax tools. They're financial, they're financial tools, right? That's really what they are. They're financial tools. It's not just about looking at the you know, that's a beautiful number to see, you know, oh, I just have $100,000 in my pocket because I use this tax tool. Uh, but the real is, all right, what are you going to turn that into? The real benefit is, okay, how many millions of dollars can we convert this into with the benefit of leverage um, over the next decade, right? And that's, and the compounding is super powerful. So 1031 exchange allows you to avoid paying taxes on this gain when you sell appreciated real estate. Uh, so let's use back of the napkin and I'll take a cue from you if you wanna really take a deeper dive because I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify just to illustrate. I think it's fine to, to simplify in this case, but I think the, the one important thing that, that we do wanna be clear about is what some of the basic requirements and timelines are because I think there's a lot of misconceptions that are out there in the real estate industry particularly from folks who are maybe it's their first or second deal. We work with folks all the time that come to us and say, oh, I'd love to 1031 this. And we're like, there's no way that's going to happen. So um, uh, basically, if, if you could kind of touch on that, um, along with your simplified deal, I know I'm, I'm asking a lot, but um, that's... Uh, <laughs> let's do it. But, all right. Okay, let's say you've got a deal. The gain on sale would be a million dollars. That would be the gain, right? You bought a property, your basis of the property um, is a million, you're selling it for two million. Right there, you've got a million dollar capital gain. Taxes on that, combined state, federal, depending where you're at, you know, it's gonna be somewhere between 20 to 40% uh, because you're gonna be in the highest capital gains rate. You add state tax on top of that, that investment income tax. Um, you're going 20 to, you know, somewhere between 20 to 40 percent. With the 1031 exchange, the idea is, is that you never really exited. You never got control of the money. So you come to say, we short 1031 exchange services. The proceeds from the sale come to us. We hold that. You find another asset to reinvest in. The money goes into that asset or multiple assets. Um, and then you just avoided paying. Two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars of taxes, and you got yourself an additional million dollars of real estate, right? Because had you paid the taxes, right, you would have been two to four hundred grand poorer, um, and would have less for the down payment. So, in a nutshell, that's what ten thirty one does. Let's talk some timelines. Number one, you'd be amazed how people come to us like, you know, I've been thinking about doing ten thirty one exchange. I know this thing is out there. And amazingly, I just sold my property yesterday, million dollar gain. Um, I want to start an exchange. That happens all the time, by the way. So, yes. 
And so the key thing to understand is you've got to start the exchange process before closing, preferably a couple of weeks before closing. Yes, if you're at the closing table, we could still make it happen. But do us all a favor. Let's get this ball rolling, you know, a couple of weeks before closing. Uh, because, again, the idea is that what really happens in an exchange is you assign your contract to us and assign the sales proceeds to us. And the 1031QI, we get the sales proceeds, um, and therefore, you never receive them. That is the key to avoiding taxes. So the moment you closed, it's too late to make an exchange happen. So that's the first thing. It's not even so much about timeline, right? You're probably thinking 45, 180, right? The key thing is exchange documents and exchange process has to be initiated pre-closing. Get us involved as soon as you kind of, you know, we're happy to be involved, you know, as soon as you're busy, you're even contemplating the sale, but really the best time is, you know, once you've got a contract, let's talk, let's get an exchange document in place. Um, and so that we can give you the benefit of 1031 exchange. All right. Now we did that. Yeah, go ahead. What's, what's the question? Sorry. We, 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 we have um, a construction team actually outside. We're doing a little work um, and uh, things are loud. So I apologize on that. That's one of the troubles of uh, real estate development. Sometimes it gets a little noisy. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the 1031 exchange, one of the things I wanted to also touch on and ask you, because there's a tremendous amount of confusion that gets involved with it, is on the concept of like-kind properties. Um, what is a like-kind property and how does that factor into the 1031 game? Yeah, so the, the great question. Like-kind is way broader um, than folks actually realize. I'm curious, am I able to do a, a screen share? So here we've got this organized by topic. We've got 1031 exchange. And let's go to 1031 exchange from start to finish. Because okay. Like kind and real property. So we've got the section here for nerds only. Just want to get an idea of how broad this actually gets. And that's fine. We are all real estate nerds, and I'm, I would guesstimate at least the vast majority of folks listening are real estate nerds as well, so it's all right. <laughs> okay, so at a high level, you know, if, if almost everything that is real estate is like kind. So real estate since Trump tax reform, before Trump tax reform, it was, you know, much the, the, you know, the like kind topic was way more complex. Uh, but since there's no more like kind for baseball players and no more like kind for airplanes, it's real estate. And within real estate, almost everything that is real estate is like kind to other real estate. <laughs> right. So you can go from, you know, you can go from raw land to multifamily to self storage to, you know, you name it just about you can do it if it's real estate it's real estate and it's can treat it as like kind where it gets really cool is that you can actually things that we would not even think about and think of as real estate is actually real estate so you can have certain you know leasehold rights right 30 years on the on the lease that's real estate um mineral rights so there are so many things that are we go beyond what we think of as real estate, and you can see here, right? Here we've got, this is more or less, there was no way to simplify this, and, but this is kind of some of the stuff. So it's a range of licenses, easements, all sorts of things, rights that derive their value from underlying real property may qualify as real estate. Most folks don't need this level of detail. What's really important is if in your mind it's real estate, it's most likely like kind to anything else that in your mind is real estate. And it's probably like kind for a whole lot of stuff that you wouldn't even believe is treated as real estate. Well, well, I must say that, that, that does blow my mind. Um, uh, I've definitely done some, some uh, extreme uh, variations in terms of 
properties to land or to farmland or to uh, even an Airbnb unit. Um, but um, I never even really thought in, in my head because we don't have a whole lot of that in Northern Illinois mineral rights. So um, uh, on that note, I'd, I'd just like to follow up with one additional thing. Um, and I know, I know you mentioned uh, 45 days and 180 days. How does that factor into the process? Because um, I, I know timelines are less important than the before and after closing, but how do those timelines factor in? Yeah, well, let's. This is super important. Uh, these are many. These are some things that investors hear about most oftenly, but are crucial uh, to understand. Because being that this is driven by regulations, there's they're very unforgiving, powerful tax tool, and we don't want to fudge it because of some <laughs> something that's minor in our eyes. So there is there's 45 days and 180 days. Right. So the key thing is to understand that these two periods run concurrently. We'll break out what each of them are, but you do not have 180 plus 45. <laughs> the total sum amount of days for a safe harbor 1031 exchange is 180 days start to finish. Um, number one. So that's a common misconception that like people think I've got 45 plus 180. It can never go beyond 180 days from start to finish. What is the 45-day IP period? So Congress, although they've given us the regulations, they give us 180 days to an exchange. They kind of wanted to narrow the opportunity and say that we're not – in order for it to say that you really are staying in this deal, we understand that real estate transactions take time. So we're going to give you 45 days to identify your replacement property or close on it, right? Of course, you can close in the 45 days. But the rem anything after 45 days, um, that's kind of a window that you get to close on property. But you, you can only, for to have a successful exchange, you've got to be closing on a property that you identified by day 45. So by day 45, if you've not yet acquired replacement property, what you have to send us is a designation notice, identifying the properties that you've got your eye on as potential replacement property for your 1031 exchange. Then you get the balance of the 180 days to actually close the deal. But if it's not something that was on the list, if you go ahead and, and say, hey, I find the property that I want to buy. And it was not on the list of properties that you ID'd by day 45, that will not be treated as like kind replacement property. So the way that the regulations actually say it is in order to be like kind, it has to be, has must have been identified by day 45. So day 45, these deadlines do not get extended for holidays. They almost don't get extended for anything. So folks are like, oh. My, you know, your tax returns, you know, those get excited. You know, if the tax deadline falls on a weekend or a holiday, right, the deadline is actually the subsequent business day. 1030, 1031 deadlines do not follow that approach. So whenever that 45 days is up, it's up, even if it's a weekend, even if it's a holiday. It's not like, oh, I'll deal with this when I get back to the office on Monday morning, <laughs> right? Um, and, for, you know, you've got to do that. IP has got to be in by midnight of day 45. And the way it works is, uh, being that every minute counts, the day of the initial closing is actually day zero. So day one is the day following the closing of your sale property. Then you've got 45 days, you know, to either close. You know, if you close on a property, it's automatically like kind. But if you haven't closed on your replacement property, it's got to be identified by midnight of day 45, and then you have the rest of the exchange period uh, to actually close. Well, the, there's one last thing uh, I'd like to talk about with closing and your tax implications is uh, one of the things that we've been doing recently has been um, increasing amounts of reverse 1031s. And so I'm curious, what is a reverse 
uh, 1031 for all of our listeners. And could you explain a little bit about how that works? Yes, I'm excited to talk about this. Um, slightly more advanced topic, but it's something it's, which- It's fine. It's fine. We can de- dig into advanced topics. We have an educated audience, so it's all right. And, and conceptually, I love breaking it down, getting past just like the, the rules. Let's understand the concept at play. So typically, when we talk about a 1031 exchange, we're talking about a forward exchange, um, which is you sell a property, you have a gain, money comes to 1031 QI, you find something else to buy. Um, that's how it goes. But what happens? If you actually uh, want to, you find a property that you want to buy, but you haven't yet sold the property that's going to have the gain, right? So the timetable and the sequence is, is reversed. Is there a way to get the benefit of a 1031 exchange, even if you sell the property that has the gain? After acquiring, you know, your replacement property, can we reverse the sequence? Right. Just guess. So you see this, you come up here, right? Reverse exchange. So the IRS gave us a safe harbor, just like they gave us a safe harbor for forward exchanges. They gave us a safe harbor for um, reverse exchanges. So let's talk about everything that can be structured in numerous ways, but let's talk about the typical structuring, the concept. So a reverse exchange uses something called an exchange accommodation title holder. And that is distinct from qualified intermediary. So while we provide both of these services in an integrated way, they're really different and distinct from each other. And sometimes these terms get used interchangeably, qualified intermediary and exchange accommodator. But when we use exchange accommodation title holder, we're referring to something that is very distinct. The concept is, is that when you buy, find that replacement property, rather than you taking title to it, we go on title. So you have not actually acquired it. We hold it. We are on title, which is different than your typical forward exchange where we never go on title. Uh, So we are on title. And that kind of keeps you from actually being treated as having acquired it. Then you go ahead, market your property that you're going to sell. And then when it comes time to sell that, we then do an exchange with you on those two assets, the property that you're selling and the property that you're holding. Uh, So that's what we call an exchange last reverse exchange, right? That's confusing. You know, (laughs) an exchange last, or you can have an exchange first. So that's the concept. Now, the IRS gave us a safe harbor for doing this um, because in tax law, uh, if we would be treated as your agent, then there goes your 1031 exchange, right? So (laughs) we we buy it. And even if you go on title, um, if there's something that could be treated as agency, um, you wouldn't get any of the benefits, right? When it comes to legal matters and tax matters, we always have to look at the underlying substance. Right, and not and get beyond the way it's papered over. So if the old, if we're truly your agent, right, then we haven't really achieved anything, even if we've gone on title. So the IRS has given us a safe harbor where they said if you kind of follow these rules for 1031 exchange purposes, we're not going to treat the exchange accommodation, the exchange accommodation title holder, or EAT for short, um, just easier to say EAT, um, as being the agent of the taxpayer. So in the reverse exchange, we go on title, we buy, acquire the replacement property, and we hold that, we kind of bank that for you while you go out and try to sell the property that has the gain. And when you actually are ready to go to closing on that, at that point, we're really doing a forward exchange. So this is where the key concept is. A reverse exchange is really a forward exchange. Right. So it's a forward exchange that has an exchange accommodation title holder in the mix. That's really what it is. So we hold it. We hold the replacement property. Think of us for tax purposes as some third party that's holding the property. 
Um, and then you do the exchange when you're actually ready to sell um, your property that has the gain. Very informative. And, and this is, I think, a critical thing that we're seeing more and more in the real estate business. So it's, it's great to cover it. But the only bad news I have is I think we're getting to the end of the podcast. And so <laughs> uh, I, think, I think what that means is two things. One, we definitely need to have you come on again. Um, and the, uh, the second thing is we're going to get into our final four which is always kind of our fun topics that we can cover that give us a little bit more insight into you. And I think ultimately a little bit more insight into the real estate industry. The most important topic that we like to look for is all the way at the end, but the first topic, and this is a topic I truly love, which is where do you think the future of real estate tax law is going ultimately? And this could be 10 years out, this could be five years out, but is there something that we should be looking for uh, going forward? That's a great question. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, so I'd rather, I think, say where I, in a sense, where I think it should go. All right, um, that's totally where will fine. I, <laughs> where will <laughs> actually be? Taxation is it really is a mess, and it's you don't great. say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's great. anyone who's taken tax law would agree with you. So go ahead, <laughs> and, and that creates. And frankly, I think the, yes, it's great for folks that are master taxation. It creates incredible opportunity, but it really creates incredible pitfalls. It really does need simplification. Uh, so as a CPA, as a tax professional, in a, in a personal way, maybe I, I benefit from this mess, right? But frankly, I think it, it's got to change. It's got to be simplified because the, your average um, you know, taxpayer wants to do the right thing, wants to be smart about their taxes. Uh, but the way the tax code is built, it's made it very difficult to do so. So there's a huge ROI to working with a tax professional. But I think from an administrator perspective, it really ought to be simplified. Yeah, I, I like I, you can't get a stronger amen from me uh, in agreement. Um, I, I remember the first time sitting into our, our tax law course and, and going through the code. And um, look, as somebody who's who's got a JD, if I'm struggling to understand sometimes the tax law, you can only imagine what that mom and pop shop is. So um, in terms of in terms of going on to uh, another topic that I that I love dearly. Um, Bernard, if you had to go back in time and tell yourself, um, you know, leaving high school, leaving college, uh, one little bit of advice, what would that bit of advice be? I'd say be more uh, proactive, more assertive, more confident, believe in yourself, um, take action, kind of all in the same vein. There is as they say, 99% of, of opportunity is showing up. Um, there is <laughs> yeah. so much yes. opportunity um, and so many folks stay on the sidelines, you know, while they figure stuff out. Get in the game uh, because if you get in the game, interact with people, you'll learn so much more from being involved um, than you can you know, from passive studying. So whatever it is that you're pursuing, be active, you know, be active, be proactive, be confident, be assertive. You're amazing. Um, you've got a lot to offer and, you know, dive right in. Uh, amazing advice. Um, uh, and, and to go along with that, uh, I would say uh, there's, there's one way that I, I think that folks can learn not in the arena. And I, I would say that that's books. Uh, and um, I'm an avid reader. Uh, look, uh, behind me is a, just a small little tidbit of my collection, mainly just books that I, I want uh, immediately. Um, what's a book that's influenced you besides the tax code? Mind you. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I won't, I won't, I won't uh, give you that one. Uh, so my favorite author I think is Nassim Nicholas Taleb. All right. Uh, All right. Um, 
But if we wanted to take something that's maybe a little easier reading <laughs> um, and a little, you know, and is not, you know, a five part series, um, I'd go for The Drunkard's Walk. Okay. All right. Uh, it's a lot about the theme is the same, a lot about randomness, probability. Uh, and really, it comes back to what we spoke about a moment ago. Uh, while some of these folks don't have the exact same, you know, Talib, you know, and, and the Drunkard's Walk, they don't necessarily have the same outlook, uh, but it's getting involved in the same disciplines. And, and a randomness means to say is opportunity strikes. You can't necessarily predict everything. Um, so you got to get out there, roll the die as many times as you can. Uh, that's really the name of the game. Uh, not being too scientific about it, of course, you have to have a logical approach to things. Uh, but it's really about getting out there because there is so much opportunity, but you got to roll the die, right? Roll the die as many times as you can. Look, wonderful advice. Um, so we get to the last question, and this is the most important question on the podcast. And the whole reason why we created the podcast in the first place is to have in-depth, long-form conversations with great people. So who's the next person we should bring on the podcast? The next person you should bring on the podcast. There are a lot of great folks out there. Uh, what I would say is somebody that's kind of the same uh, tax professional. And I'd say the key thing, what I love is working with great, 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 superb um, tax advisors because we understand each other and we're able to very quickly figure out, all right, is your client going to benefit from using these tools? And nine out of 10 times, if they send somebody to us, right? We know this is the right thing for them. Yeah. Um, who I would suggest strongly is somebody by the name of Michael Plax. Okay. All right. Have you heard that name? I have not heard that name. So uh, tell me a little bit more about Michael. Okay. We've actually hosted him a couple of times. Uh, so I'll put the screen share on there. But we've had him okay, that's fine. On a couple of times. Um, he is an enrolled agent. Um, so that's not CPA, but when it comes to taxes, it's about who knows. That's ultimately, it's about the knowledge. He's an EA uh, based in Texas. Um, very sharp guy, very witty guy. Um, he's actually in, came over from the former Soviet Union in the early, early I think 1992. Uh, but super sharp, super witty. And he says it like it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, the... Uh, you know, the way things are in tax code, where you benefit, his focus is real estate investors. That is his focus, and he is a, a master at his craft. Well, we'll have to have him on. Uh, Bernard, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast today. And the last question, and this is also a critical one, is how's the best, uh, or what's the best way, and, and how should all of our listeners come out and reach, reach, uh, reach out to you? So the best way to reach out to us is you've got two places, reshorefinancial.com. Right. There's members.reshorefinancial.com. Uh, so the members space is purely educational content. We've got it organized. You saw that, you know, curated 1031 exchange, cost segregation, self-directed retirement accounts, entity structuring, almost any real estate related tax or financial topic is in there. It's searchable. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, then there's reshorefinancial.com. That's R-E-S-U-R-E -E financial.com. And that's where you can find actually, you know, there's a messaging option there to message us directly. Um, we've got, you know, there's a page to initiate services whenever the time is ready. Title, 1031 exchange, cost segregation, and self-directed retirement accounts. Awesome. Bernard, thank you so much for hopping on and we got to have you on in the future. Uh, Gordon, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Thanks so much for hosting. Thanks again to Bernard. We appreciate his insights. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like, a five-star rating, or review. Your comments, interactions, and subscriptions truly matter and help us continue to provide quality guests. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Gordon Lamphere with The Real Finds Podcast. Thank you for listening.